This video lecture will endeavor to clarify Donna Haraway's The Promises of Monsters. Haraway opens her essay declaring her purpose. She says that her intent is to provide, quote, a mapping exercise and travelogue through mindscapes and landscapes of what may count as nature in certain local and global struggles, end quote. There are a few things to note here. First is Haraway's desire to underscore the philosophy that the physical and imagined are connected. That is, that this connection between the physical and imagined isn't imaginary, but very much physical, so much so that it can be mapped as if it were a journey through a landscape. Secondly, her statement calls to question what counts as nature. We talked about in class how nature includes not just humans, but non-humans, and how non-humans includes not just animals, plants, and rocks, but technology and ideas. So nature is an ecosystem of the imagined and physical. When we say nature is everything, then we literally mean everything. To this, Haraway adds that nature is a topos, or commonplace. This is on page two of her essay. The concept of topos is a rhetorical one. We use the words topos today to be synonymous with the word topic. The word topos actually means places, though, not just ideas. In rhetoric, topos indicates that a speaker or writer must search for a mental place in their mind in order to make an argument. Arriving at one's mental destination is the equivalent of successfully developing an argument. Haraway is using the word topos in this manner. By calling nature a topos, she is saying that it is a commonplace, a place to which each of us arrives not just physically, but mentally. Again, her point is to underscore how the physical and imagined are naturally connected. This helps us to understand what she means when she says, quote, nature is a topic of public discourse on which much turns, even the earth, end quote. That is, nature is more than the earth. It is the all, including what we normally call nature, that is plants, animals, humans, etc., and that which we don't usually call nature, that is, it's not just other physical non-human things like technology, but abstract things like ideas. When Haraway calls nature an artifactualism, a word that is her own neologism, what she means then is that nature is both fact and fiction. Again, embracing this idea that nature is the all, the privileged fact, and the non-privileged fiction. So we've established Haraway's purpose and her basic definition of nature. The map she uses to record her rhetorical travels through a topography of ideas is on page 12. This map is a variation of the Grimus semiotic square. The semiotic square is a tool to stimulate one's imagination about any subject. It takes a subject and identifies the ways people have structured meaning by opposition and what meanings exist in between those binary extremes. Let's look at an example. A common example of the semiotic square at work is its mapping of constructed gender identities. We often think of gender as binary. And this map shows us how such labels are constructed. To use the square, you need two related concepts which are labeled on the map as A and B. The map then demands us to imagine what not A means and what not B means, as well as what concepts fall in between these extremes. In this example, let's assign male as A and female as B. This means we will then call not A, not male, and not masculine, which will indicate simply with not M, and we'll call not B, not female, and not feminine, which we will indicate as simply not F. Let's think about the gender identities that fall in between these assigned concepts then. Between A and not B, we will discover the constructed gender identity of the real man, or macho man. Between B and not A, we will discover the constructed gender identity of the ultra-female, or the seductress. Between A and B, we will find the androgen and hermaphrodite, who equally combine constructed gender identities and features. And between not A and not B, we'll find the angel, who is genderless. Haraway uses the semiotic square in order to identify the meta-narratives, the binary extremes like male and female, that hold our imaginations back, as well as oppress the other. Remember here that the other is the concept of an entity that is different and therefore potentially inferior or superior to the self or the same. Haraway's definition of the inappropriated other is specifically those singular or collective entities whom, quote, history has denied the strategic illusion of self-identity, end quote. Not only does Haraway's semiotic square identify the problematic binary extremes of hegemonic narratives, 
but it purposefully seeks to interrupt these meta narratives by making explicit the articulations of those others that fall in between the binary extremes of hegemonic narratives. This is a key point. Haraway uses the semiotic square to interrupt the meta narratives, and we'll see how she does this physically in her map in just a little bit. Before we get there, we should clarify the difference between representation and articulation. These concepts are most heavily discussed on pages 19 and 20 of our essay. Here, she indicates that representation is the form of communication for the dominant parties, those who get to speak for others, be it men speaking for women, white people for brown people, humans for non-humans, etc., are the dominant parties. They are the representers whose narratives are privileged. Today, for instance, Haraway argues that science is a privileged voice, using the narrative of objectivity to justify their superiority over other non-scientific voices. However, science is also a language of representation. It is based upon hegemonic narratives that undergo paradigm shifts, such as a dramatic shift from Newtonian mechanics, which envisioned a highly predictable world that suited the Enlightenment optimism and belief in human mastery over the universe, to quantum mechanics, which envisions a highly unpredictable world and speaks to the growing human acceptance of diminished authority over the natural world. A point we cannot ignore here is that the meta narratives are influenced by the unrecognized articulations of others. So the difference between representation and articulation is that while representation is a privileged voice speaking for another, articulation is an other communicating its own meaning. However, this articulation isn't always in the form of language and may be better understood as an action or even the lack of actions. In general, the message of representation is one of dominance, while the message of articulation is one of connectivity. And so we return to Haraway's semiotic square. She is looking to interrupt these messages of dominance via the messages of connectivity. Hence, her subtitle for the semiotic square is through artifactualism to elsewhere. Or in other words, through the binary constructs of nature as a system of dominance and oppression to imaginations of the in-between places of connectivity. The second half of her subtitle, A Regenerative Politics for Inappropriated Others, refers to the idea that narratives of dominance only duplicate the self in a sterilizing, redundant, or tautological process, while narratives of connectivity create collectives of inappropriated others in a fertile process. We are not prepared to map Haraway's essay, and we will use her structure of the semiotic square in order to do so. In Haraway's semiotic square on page 12, she indicates four quadrants, real space, outer space, inner space, and virtual space. Unlike a conventional semiotic square, Haraway admits that she will be taking the unconventional approach by moving through the square in a clockwise fashion, with A and not A on the left side, and B and not B on the right side, rather than crisscrossing the two. Even so, for all intents and purposes, this is still a semiotic square. From the outset, these quadrants represent the four main subjects she addresses throughout her essay. So as we read her essay, she takes us through the subheadings of real space, outer space, inner space, and finally, virtual space. Her goal is to find the narratives that connect these four quadrants in order to locate a point of interruption for all of them. She does this through a series of examples that outline the details of her semiotic square. To make this as simple as possible, I'm going to take Haraway's lead and approach the semiotic square one quadrant at a time. I will not be able to include every example that she talks about in her essay because then the map will become too monstrous. However, I will cover the major examples that help elucidate the thought process and effect of this semiotic square. So, Part of the reason why I want to take this one quadrant at a time is because Haraway embeds a smaller semiotic square within each quadrant. Her map is one of semiotic squares within semiotic squares, each connecting to another in order to locate the point of interruption that gives us hope against the monster of oppressive narrative. In this quadrant, the concepts Haraway identifies as the corners of our smaller semiotic square are the feminine self, the wild other, saving nature, and social nature. This is where our discussions from class can be plugged in. 
The feminine self is the narrative of Jane Goodall as a representative of a healing female touch in a world divided between humans and nature. Haraway, of course, points out how this narrative is one of representation rather than articulation as the image of Goodall's and the chimps embracing hands sweeps over and ignores the many other voices involved in this narrative, such as the African nations, who were at the time gaining independence and seeking voices of their own to represent the lands in which they live. I will leave these figures and events for you all to unpack and analyze in the forums. What this map will do is simply outline how each figure and event falls on the map and how each is connected in order to create a conversation of diffraction rather than reflection, that is of articulation rather than representation. To this end, then, let's continue. The wild other than the not A of the feminine self is the chimp with whom Jane Goodall holds hands. The concepts of saving nature versus social nature are once again concepts based upon the difference between representation and articulation, the idea that someone must speak for nature and save it, and then on the other hand, the idea that nature is a collective full of actants who together create their own meaning. Under Saving Nature, we could catalog the example of Joe Kane's question, Who Speaks for the Jaguar? And under Social Nature, we could catalog the example of the Kayapo Man, who becomes a part of a natural collective, a meaningful collective of humans and non-humans, video cams, plants, land, animals, audiences, and so forth, that articulates together as a social community of others. What they articulate for Haraway for the purposes of this essay is, most importantly, the fact that they are a social nature that is not an oppressed nature like the chimp, or nature that needs saving, or nature that needs colonizing and guidance, as was suggested in Goodall's narrative, but rather a nature that is constructed by multiple, often unheard and unrecognized actants. In our example of the Kayapo Man, the Kayapo Man's argument is defined just as much by the limitations and opportunities of his tools, the video cams, as it is by his subjects, the land plants and animals. At the same time, the land plants and animals are defined just as much by the Kayapo Man's subjective gaze as it is by the video cams objective lens. Each of these rhetorical situations are then additionally influenced by the insertion of the audience's reaction and interpretations. What we have here is a rhetorical situation full of agents, and each agent influences the constructed meaning. This is why Haraway insists on us seeing nature as a social construct rather than an objective reality. We simply cannot escape the social nature of nature. On page 15, Haraway bemoans the fact that this semiotic square she's exposed provides no point of interruption, and so she suggests some of her own, one of them including the idea that the research sites from which Goodall operated comprised of a diverse number of unrepresented researchers and their supporting families from Europe, Africa, and North America. This point of interruption would be located in the middle of the semiotic square. Let us move on then to the second quadrant, outer space. This quadrant also has a smaller semiotic square within it. However, this semiotic square overlaps that of the first quadrant, which could in part explain why it's so difficult to delineate Haraway's essay, that is, it isn't easily categorized into main and sub points, because all of the points will, in the end, connect in a valiant demonstration of her argument that nature is about connectivity. So in this quadrant, quadrant B. The concepts in each corner are saving nature, social nature, masculine self, and feminine other. Under saving nature, we can catalog Ham's experience as the, quote, projectile of self-made reborn man, end quote. With this concept in hand, we might better understand the point of saving nature as one that is more about saving the self rather than actually saving nature. Under social nature, we can catalog Mother's and Other's Day, which sought to bring together the collective ideological and physical realms of space and earth, feminine and masculine, wild and technological. Under masculine self, we can catalog the Cold War masculinity, which sought to dominate outer space, just as the feminine self in Quadrant A sought to dominate real space. And under the feminine other of Quadrant B, we can catalog Mother's Day, which prefaced the social nature event of Mother's and Other's Day. 
This feminine other speaks to the idea that while men can pursue dreams of dominance, the female others are presumably responsible for establishing peace. At this point, we might notice that a pattern in the map is forming, that is, social nature is falling in between the quadrants. If this maintains, which, spoilers, it does, the concept of social nature will become the major point of interruption in this semiotic square. And it is this concept of social nature that will allow us to reimagine and rethink the meta-narratives of dominance that define the borders, especially the narrative that self and others are separate entities. Let us move onward to quadrant not B, or inner space. Once again, Haraway overlaps the semiotic square that is within this quadrant with the semiotic squares in the first and second quadrants. At each corner of the semiotic square in this quadrant are saving nature or saving outer self, victorious self, saving nature or saving inner self, and social nature. At this point, we're getting away from the idea of gendered selves and focusing more on the inner, outer, wild, and technological ideas. Under saving nature, or saving outer self, we can catalog the concept of the extraterrestrial self that must be saved from the others within inner space. Under victorious self, again another genderless concept, we can catalog the concept of a warring self, not unlike the masculine self in quadrant B. This warring self is predicated upon a language of defense and invasion. Under saving nature slash saving inner self, we can catalog the defended self, whose isolation from the social community may result in death. And under social nature, we can catalog the immune system itself, the body's collective of microbes or others that results in what Haraway describes as a community of knowledge and action. Again, the important point is that social nature is where Haraway sees real knowledge and action, and this idea opposes the traditional concept that the self possesses knowledge and is the actor or agent. Finally, we have reached quadrant not A, virtual space. At this point, Haraway cannot help but tease us. This is an unfinished quadrant, left open to allow for further generation. She suggests that too much connectivity results in a closed system. So, as Haraway says, quote, Articulation must remain open, its densities accessible to action and intervention. When the system of connections closes in on itself, when symbolic action becomes perfect, the world is frozen in a dance of death. The cosmos is finished, and it is one." End quote. In other words, it is precisely this idea of oneness that Haraway is trying to prevent, and so she refuses to limit the quadrant of virtual space, which is our quadrant for the imagined, rather than physical realms. We can perhaps plot one entity here in this quadrant, though, and that is the cyborg painting by Lynn Randolph. This painting would fall under the concept of social nature, as it once again brings together the concepts of space and earth, feminine and masculine, white and brown, wild and technology, and so forth. In Haraway's analysis of the painting, she insists that the entity in the painting is not finished because he, she presents a plethora of conversations which are ongoing between the traditionally dominant and traditionally inappropriated others. In the end, Haraway's point is not to silence men, science, technology, postmodernism, industrialism, or any of the other ideologies of dominance. Her point is to bring together these already recognized voices with those who are not recognized, a fairly reasonable request and argument. She also wants to emphasize the idea that theory is physical, a part of nature. And finally, she wants to redefine the monster. As your worksheet from class points out, whereas the monster of past has been the other, the threat, freak, and outlier, the monster of today has been the big man, the corporations, industry. And so Haraway begins her essay by suggesting that she is the heroic pilgrim opposing these monsters of postmodernism. However, by the end of her essay, she is suggesting that we are each and all of us monsters. Because monsters are not just traditionally the outliers, they are also the grotesque, entities of incongruous beings like minotaurs or satyrs, creatures which combine unlike parts like the head of an animal and body of a human. By the end of the essay, Haraway is asking us to be the monsters, to be the entities of incongruous being, comprised of not just ourselves, but of a collection of others. She wants us to be her cyborgs, her hybrid monsters of unified human and non-human 
extraterrestrial and microbial, feminine and masculine, wild and technological being.